Yeah, first of all, thank you very much for the invitation. I'm really happy to participate in this workshop. Unfortunately, online, it would be nice to be in Oslo at that time of the year. So yeah, so my talk is about random walks on, on uh, SL2C. This is a joint work with uh, Jean and Wu, both from, from Singapore. So this is based on uh, two papers that are already written and one paper that will appear soon uh, on the same topic. Okay, so let's start with uh, some uh, basic uh, probability theory, some classical probability theory. So in, in, in classical probability, we are usually uh, interested in sequences of random variables that takes values in the real uh, line that are independent and identically distributed. So this means that uh, the outcome at, at step n is independent of what came before and identically distributed means that at every step we have the same uh, distribution, same probability distribution. So well, the, the usual name for this is IID. And then the main uh, theme of classical probability theory is to describe uh, sums of this type. So we take the sum from uh, X1 up to Xn, where at each step we take one of these uh, random variables. And then study what is the behavior when n, n goes to, to infinity. So we can try to uh, make things a little bit more geometric. So you can imagine that we, we are uh, over R here and we start at some point, say at zero. And then at each step, we walk uh, uh, along uh, this sequence. So which means that we add X1 or X2 or X3 and then uh, repeat this procedure according to, to this probability. So for instance, we started here. If X1 is positive, we go right. We can go a little bit further and then come back, etc. So we have a, a standard uh, random walk uh, along uh, the real line. And the goal is to describe the delimiting behavior of, of these things. And then you have all these limit theorems from probability theory, like the law of large numbers, central limit theorem, law of iterated logarithm, etc. Okay, so this is a quite well-developed uh, topic and then quite old. And what I'm talking about today is uh, some sort of non-abelian version of, of this uh, theory. So we start with a group. In general, uh, we take a Lie group. Uh, and in this talk, I'll mainly be concerned with SL2C, but it works in any group. So take G, uh, a group and consider now a sequence of IID random variables. But instead of taking values in the real line, we take values in this uh, uh, group G. Okay, and then we can play the same game. Instead of, of adding uh, the variables, we can take the product from G1 up to Gn of these uh, IID uh, G-valued random variables and look at the behavior uh, when n goes to infinity. So here's a schematic picture. So for instance, if we start the identity, we apply some element of the group G1, and then we can apply a second one G2, G3, G2, G1, et cetera. Okay, so this is the goal of, of the theory of, of random walks on groups to describe the asymptotic uh, behavior of, of this uh, process. Okay, uh, and uh, one uh, strikingly different uh, thing about the, this new random walk is that we don't have uh, an abelian group anymore, not necessarily. So if you go from G1 and then G2, it's not the same as applying G2 and G1. So this makes things more complicated and if more interesting in some cases. Okay. And uh, uh, also, instead of looking at uh, the random walk on the group itself, we can make this group act on a space. For instance, if G acts on a space X, uh, we have an induced random walk on, on this space just by applying these random elements on, on the space X. Okay, so this is useful because in many situations, the group G, for instance, in, in the case I'm talking today, the group G is non-compact, but nevertheless, it acts on some nice compact space. And when we have compactness, it's more comfortable to, to work. Okay. So this is also somewhat classical topic, not as classical as classical probability theory, but uh, it is well studied. So maybe the seminal paper in the topic is this uh, paper by Furstenberg, non-commuting random products from 63. And then that is where the first uh, fundamental theorems about these things were, were proved. But this is a, like a very active and, and that has a long history. So there are like many good, uh, important people that worked uh, in, in related problems, okay? So this is the main, the main topic today, study this random walk and then uh, some induced random walks on, on spaces where, where the group acts.
Okay, so from now on, I'll fix the group G to be the group of two by two uh, complex matrices. Uh, and then we will take a sequence of random matrices uh, in this group that are IID and have some law that I call mu. So what, what, it, what this means, is means that the probability of finding, uh, of, of taking a, uh, a matrix in some open, some, some set of matrices G is exactly the measure mu of, of this matrix. So if you're not too familiar with that, let me give just a simple example, but that is already uh, interesting enough. So for instance, consider this, uh, these two matrices uh, A and B. So they are uh, actually integer matrices. So A is this matrix uh, 2, 1, 1, and B is uh, 0, minus 1, 1, 0. And then we flip a coin and choose between uh, A and B, whether it's heads uh, or tails. So if it's heads, we take A. If it's tails, we take B. And then at each step, we repeat this process and multiply the, the outcomes. Okay, so this is uh, mainly like the, the most simple random walk uh, we can think of. And in this case, the, the measure, uh, the law in G is nothing but the average of two direct masses, one at A and one at B. So even in this uh, very, very simple example, uh, we need the whole general theory to, to give uh, interesting results uh, about, about that. Okay, so if you want to prove limit theorems for these random products, uh, we, we cannot do it by hand, even in this uh, simple case. So uh, since we're taking the products, so we're interested in, in, in products of length n, and once we have mu, we know what is the law of the, the products. The law of the products is given by the so-called convolution of mu with itself. Okay. So if you don't know the definition, this is a, a simple example. So for instance, in this, in this case here, the convolution uh, of mu with itself is nothing but all the possible uh, products between A and B with the corresponding probabilities. Okay. So when we iterate mu, we get uh, more and more uh, matrices with, with the corresponding probabilities. Okay. So it's actually a quite remarkable fact that we can find um, many analogs of, of all the classical theorems for sums of IIDs in the setting of random matrices. So the first one, uh, is the first uh, limit theorem that we have for uh, sums of IDs, which is the law of large numbers. So this dates back to, I think, Bernoulli, one of the Bernoullis uh, in 1713. And it says the following. So if you, if you take a sequence of uh, IID uh, real random variables with some expectation M, then if you sum them up and divide by N, you converge to this constant M almost surely. Okay, this, this is the classical law of large numbers. And uh, the analog here in the case of random matrices was given by Furstenberg and Kesten in, in 1960. So if you have a sequence of uh, random matrices such that the log of the norm has finite expectation, I'll come back to this condition later. Then uh, we have uh, an analog uh, of the law of large numbers that says that the random products, uh, the log of the norms of the random products divided by N converges to uh, a constant gamma, almost surely. And this gamma is a very important number. It's called the Lyapunov exponent of, of the process. Okay. So what this theorem is saying is that basically, if you look at the size of these matrices when we multiply them, all of them or almost all of them grow uh, exponentially with the same factor gamma, which is quite surprising in, in the first class. Uh, nowadays, actually, we can give like a one-line proof of, of this result just by using Kingman's subadditive ergodic theorem. But back then, they, they didn't have this uh, technology. But still, it's, it's uh, an interesting uh, result, which is the, the first analog of, of a classical uh, limit theorem for some of IADs. So now let, let us look at, look at some actions of, of SO2C in some spaces first. Uh, we make it act trivially like the, the usual uh, action, uh, linear action on C2 and on the space of, of directions uh, uh, P1, CP1, the remote sphere. So if you take a vector in C2, we can understand the action of G uh, in U uh, basically by looking at two things. One is how uh, a given vector grow, okay? So how it, it's dilated or contracted by our matrix. matrix. 
And the second thing that gives the, the, thought, the description of, of, of the dynamics is how it acts on, on directions. Okay, so how it moves directions. So this corresponds to the action on, on P1 uh, at infinity. Okay, so now we will give some results concerning these two things. First, uh, some limit theorems for the length, for the length uh, of, of some vectors. And the second one, uh, some, some results about the action on, on directions. Okay, so to study uh, the lengths, uh, first, uh, or the main object that we need to look at is the following function, which is called the norm cycle, which gives uh, the relative uh, dilation at a given direction. And we take the, the logarithm. Okay. So this will give how, how much uh, a given vector is, is stretched by, by G. And, in, in, and concerning the action on, on P1, uh, we will describe the action in terms of invariant measures on, on P1. So we have this uh, important concept of stationary measure that says that a given probability measure on the Riemann sphere is stationary if it satisfies the following uh, invariance property. So it's not invariant by every matrix in the support of mu, but it's invariant uh, on average. So it's quite uh, easy to see from, com from the compactness of Q1 that we always have at least one uh, stationary measure. So we can ask when there is a single one, a canonical one that will help us uh, study this uh, random process. And the answer was given by Furstenberg and it's uh, a small definition before. So in order to state uniqueness, uh, we'll give the following definition. So take a subset of the set of uh, matrices SL2C. And then we will say that this set is elementary if either uh, satisfies uh, one of the two conditions. Either S is contained in a compact subgroup of SL2C, which means that when we iterate, you don't grow, uh, the norm doesn't grow, or S preserves a finite number of points in, in P1. Okay, so these are the sets that we want to avoid because the, the dynamic is somehow trivial in this case. So as a, an example, if you take uh, the two matrices from the previous slide, is previous slide is easy to see that they they form a non-elementary set because this matrix here is hyperbolic, so when you iterate, we, we go to infinity, and this matrix here uh, doesn't preserve the eigenspaces of the first one, so we, this condition also uh, doesn't hold here. So we see that it's very easy to get non-elementary sets. It's enough to take two matrices, one of which is dilating in some direction and the other one that doesn't preserve the eigenspaces spaces of the first one. So if you have uh, more complicated, uh, like bigger, uh, larger uh, probability measures, then it's even easier to get non-elementary uh, subsets. Okay. So it's a, it's a very easy and easy to get condition. Okay. So here's the, fundamental theorem of Furstenberg. So if the support of our uh, probability measure mu, the law of the random walk is non-elementary, so it doesn't satisfy this condition here, then there is only one uh, invariant measure in this sense here. So there is a canonical invariant measure on P1 that describes the, the dynamics on, on the directions. Okay. So, and this is typically the case for almost all choices of, of mu we have uniqueness. And for this reason, this is called, usually called first number uh, measure. Okay, are there any questions so far? Okay, so let me move on. So uh, before uh, moving on, so this is, this is a workshop on uh, arithmetics and uh, dynamics. So let me please, at least part of the audience that might be bored so far. So this, uh, so far I, I talked about uh, complex matrices, but we can talk about other uh, matrices, matrices over other fields. For instance, we can study by the same methods, matrices that are real, uh, rational, or with coefficients in Q bar or Z, just by, by considering uh, probability measures that are supported by these uh, subgroups of of SL2R. So if you have some matrices that are of this type, we can just embed this in, you know, into our problem of studying SL2C uh, random matrices. Okay, so this is uh, quite trivial. Another uh, remark that is actually more interesting, there is a very well-developed theory parallel to the one for complex matrices that work for over uh, other fields, other local fields. So for instance, we can, we can study random walks on SL2 uh, over QP. 
and other local fields. This is uh, done uh, in very much detail in, in this book by Benoit and Council in 2016, where they developed the, the whole theory in uh, much detail. And what is uh, quite interesting, something that I learned recently is that this uh, theory here is useful to study even the case of compact big groups. So remember from the last slides that compact groups are not allowed in the definition of, of non-elementary measure because the, the norms uh, don't grow. But it's, it's interesting that if you go to another base field, something that is uh, isometric over C can be dilating uh, over QP. So we can get, uh, get non-elementary measures over here and, and apply the theory here. So, which is quite remarkable, I think. And also there are other non-Archimedean analogs of the theory. You can look at actions on Berkovich spaces and et cetera. And this also has been used by uh, Dujardin and Favre to study uh, families and the generations of, of representations into C2C. So even though I'm not talking much about the algebraic arithmetic part of, of the theory, I'd like to say that this is a, a real thing that a lot of people study and it's actually quite interesting. Okay. Okay, so let me go back to uh, limit theorems. So we saw in the first or second slide that uh, the local, the law of large numbers has a natural analog uh, for random matrices. Now I talk about uh, finer limit theorems for, for the random walks. And for this, we need to introduce some notions uh, related to moments. So when you look, for instance, if you, if you want to prove finer limit theorems, such as the central limit theorem for sums of IIDs, we need to control uh, the moments of, of the random variables, or in other words, how, how is the decay? So how, how likely it is to find a big value? So how is the decay of, of the probability and infinity? And here is the same thing, right? So we have two, two important uh, moment conditions in, in this setting. The first one uh, is what we call finite moment of order P. And we ask that some, the P, P power of the logarithm is integral. And we have this uh, stronger condition of finite exponential moment that we ask that some power of G itself is, is integral. Okay. And then we have a first analog of uh, the central limit theorem in this setting. So uh, the central limit theorem says that if you have a sequence of IIDs with a given, uh, given expectation and a finite variance, so it's a second moment condition, then uh, the proper normalization by square root of n and subtracting uh, the expectation converge to a Gaussian uh, law, so the standard uh, Gaussian law. And then we have uh, an analog of this in the setting of random matrices. So if you have a sequence of random matrices uh, such that the measure mu is non-elementary and we have this finite exponential moment condition, then Lepage showed in, in 1982 that we do have a central limit theorem for the cocycles. So remember here, uh, sigma is something that is me measuring the length of, of vectors. And we have uh, a central limit theorem for these non commuting uh, random variables. Okay. So here, uh, I, I would like to remark the following thing. So the classical, uh, central limit theorem has a, a second moment condition. So we need the square of the random variable to be integrable. But here we have a much, much stronger condition that uh, some uh, exponential of the random variable uh, log, log G is integral. So this indicates that uh, this condition is actually not the optimal one. So the optimal one would be a second moment condition. So the question of whether this could be uh, improved to get the optimal results was open for quite a long time. And this was uh, solved in 2016 by Benoit and Kahn. So they proved uh, the version, uh, the expected version for this theorem that says that uh, if you have a non-elementary measure with second uh, moment, finite second moment, then we do also have uh, the central limit theorem in the same form. And also, we in uh, one of our papers with Dean and Wu, uh, we could give a, a different uh, proof, a new alternative proof of this uh, results. Okay. So what are the the main tools? So the first main tool of flopage uh, is a spectral gap uh, type of techniques that I will detail uh, in a minute. But the problem is that. Uh, Unless we ask this strong moment condition, uh, we don't have uh, a spectral gap. 
So we cannot generalize uh, the proof. So what uh, Benoit and Kahn did, they developed uh, an alternative technique using large deviation estimates and, and some martingale calculus because to, to overcome this lack of, of spectral gap in the case of two moments. And what we did actually in, uh, in this paper is that we, we actually proved that there is, there is a spectral gap with second moment, at least in the case of SO2C. Okay. So I still have half an hour, right? Okay, so let me explain a little bit uh, what is the a spectral gap and why we would like to have such a thing. So recall that uh, our group G acts on, on the Riemann sphere P1. So most of, of the limiting behavior of, of this action uh, can be read from this uh, operator here acting on functions uh, on P1. So this is the averaging uh, operator with the Markov operator. So we basically we take a point in P1 and then we look at all, all the orbit under the probability measure mu and then we average a function along this, this orbit and we get a new function that we call uh, P, P of phi, okay? And the ideal situation is uh, where we have uh, some spectral gap. So this is the best case uh, scenario that we can hope. And what do I mean by spectral gap? It means that we can find some good function space, E, some Banach space of functions in P1, such that P acts uh, continuously in this space and the spectrum of the operator is very simple, is of this form. So what do I mean here? I mean that uh, the eigenvalue one is uh, simple and isolated. So this corresponds to the constant functions, right? Because if, if you apply the constant function uh, one, this operator uh, fixes uh, the constants. So we have an eigenvalue one, but the, the most important thing is that all the remainder of the spectrum is contained in a much smaller disk. Okay, so this is what, uh, what we call spectral gap. And this is a, an ideal situation, uh, the, the best case scenario. Why, uh, why uh, is that true? Because when we iterate this operator, which corresponds to taking uh, uh, the random walk in, in the limit, so since, since this part is quite small, it will converge to zero exponentially fast. So what we will see in the limit is just uh, the eigenspace corresponds to the constant functions. And actually uh, uh, what we get in the end, the constant that we get in the end is uh, exactly the, the value of the, the stationary measure in this point. Okay, so if you, if you have this, we have automatically exponentially fast uh, convergence towards uh, the stationary measure. Okay. So that's the, the main theorem of Lepage actually, that the, all the, the other limit terms are uh, consequence of this. So assume that mu is non-elementary and has a finite uh, exponential moment. Then, this operator here uh, has a spectral gap on some holder space of functions uh, on P1. So it means that we have uh, this picture here for the spectrum if this space uh, is a holder, holder space. And this, for this, it is crucial that we have a finite exponential moment. So we cannot generalize it to uh, lower moment conditions. Okay. So uh, our uh, theorem from uh, a couple of years ago is that uh, we can have such a picture uh, with low moments condition if you look at another space. So I'll suppose that mu is still non-elementary but has a finite moment of order uh, one half. It's a very weak moment condition. So in this case, if you have uh, such a weak moment condition, then we do have a spectral gap, but for a different space, a space of, of Sobolev functions. So the norm that we consider is not the Holder norm, but this uh, norm here. The norm uh, contains two parts. This controls the constants, it's just the average of the function, and, and this controls the outer norm of, of the derivative. Okay. So the main thing that I will explain in the next slide is that this part of the norm here is, is strictly contracting uh, when we apply the, the operator P. So that's what is was behind this spectral gap theorem. Okay. What, what do so you this, mean by what do you mean by finite moment of order one half? So it means uh, the definition of the previous slide, it means that if you integrate the square root of the log, then it's finite. Okay. okay.
actually we we announced for a finite moment of order one but later we realized that we could even improve in even uh, further to one half I can give some details after if you if you have questions okay so as I said this has uh, many uh, important uh, consequences so the first one is the uh, X distribution of points so this means that if you start with uh, a direct mass at some point in P1, and we iterate uh, the random products uh, in average, then this converges exponentially fast to the stationary measure. Okay, so this, this is one, uh, one almost immediate consequence of the result. There is some work to do, but I won't get into details. A second result that we can prove using this is that this measure has uh, some regularity. Uh, so this uses uh, some ideas of, of complex dynamics and superpotential theory. And we also uh, can give uh, a quicker uh, proof, a new proof of, of Benoit Kant's uh, central linear theorem in the case of finite two moments. Okay, so how do we do that? So this is made, uh, the, the way we prove this result is by analogy with complex dynamics, so by analogy uh, with the dynamics of correspondences. So let me just explain a little bit how this analogy works and how we would manage to prove this, this result. So the measure mu, the probability measure on, on SL2C induces a sort of correspondence uh, on P1, so generalized motivated map uh, from P1 to P1. So what, what is, uh, how this is done? So for instance, take this very simple example that I gave you before of two direct masses at A, one at A, one at B. Then the image of a point under this correspondence is just the formal sum of the image of A and B, right? So, so if you have uh, here one point X, so the image is just two points, uh, one half A of X, one half B of X, okay? So it's not a true correspondence because we have these multiplicities, but this can be uh, arranged. So related to uh, phase talk yesterday, we can see this as a, as a subset, of, as a cycle on, on the product P1 cross P1. And here the, the cycle is very simple. It's just uh, uh, the graph of A times one half plus uh, the graph of B times uh, one half. So this is a, a cycle with real, real coefficients. So if you have uh, more complicated uh, measures, so if you have a different measure mu, We'll have a more complicated uh, cycle. It's actually not a cycle. It will be a, a one uh, a one one current in the product. So it will be some sort of cloud of, of graphs on, on the product. But, but psychologically behaves just as an uh, as a as an R cycle. Okay. So yeah, under this analogy, we are in very good situations because now the random products uh, that we want to study G one up to G n. Uh, under this dictionary corresponds exactly to the iteration of this generalized correspondence. So we, we are in, in the realm of, of iterations of, of maps, not, not maps, but uh, correspondences. So there is some theory that is, that is uh, somewhat well understood, right? So we can, we can see this as, a, as an iteration problem, which is it's good for us from complex dynamics. And then the Markov operator that I introduced before, this averaging operator corresponds exactly to the pullback by this, by this map. So if you want to study the spectrum of this thing, this is just the, the spectrum of, of the pullback, okay? So there's a difficulty here, uh, an important one, is that uh, usually in dynamics, uh, we have seen uh, in the previous talk and in the phase talk, we have this notion of dynamical degrees and things work very well when we have one dynamical degree that dominates uh, the other ones. So this is what we call uh, algebraic hyperbolicity. Okay. So when we have this, uh, in, in terms of analysis, this gives a, a way to get some easy estimates or some free estimates if you want, if you have a good uh, action on cohomology. But here, the situation is, is very different from Junis' talk. We don't have this very complicated uh, degree growth or et cetera. We have only two degrees, uh, uh, D0 and D1, and both of them are equal to one because the image of, of a point is a cycle of degree one and the pre-image of a point is a cycle of degree one. So, so it's a very bad situation for dynamics because the degrees are all equal and equal to one. Okay, so there's no hope of getting a spectral gap from, from estimates coming from cohomology or, or, 
dynamic degrees, etc. So we have to overcome this this thing. And how do we do that? We do that using a uh, uh, Cauchy Schwartz type inequality for for forms for one zero forms. So this is the main inequality that make things uh, work even without a, a gap in, in cohomology. So what does the inequality say? So if you take uh, one, uh, one zero form theta from P1, then we have uh, this very nice inequality that says that the average, the square of the average is smaller than the average of the squares. Okay. So this works on the level of, of forms. So this is an inequality of, of one on forms. Okay. And even more importantly, we have this uh, inequality, but we know exactly also when we have equality. We have equality if and only if the, both pullbacks uh, agree. So this is the main ingredient of, of the spectral gap. Because now if you apply P, P is an averaging operator. So it's, it's basically what is written here. So if you look at, at the Sobolev norm, we have the constant part and, and, and the form part, which is the most important. So if you apply this inequality to the form part, we, we know already that it's contracting. So the norm is smaller or equal to one. But uh, this uh, very strong invariance here, uh, actually we, we can show that it can never happen when the measure is non-elementary. So if the measure is complicated enough, we can never have this sort of invariance. So we have a strict inequality here. So the operator on forms is, is strictly contracting and this is what gives the, the spectral gap, okay? So the spectral gap doesn't come from, from uh, homology or cohomology comes from, from this cauchy schwartz inequality. Okay. Any questions? Okay, so let me move on. So, uh, so far uh, we used the spectral gap to prove, give new proofs of known theorems. For instance, the central limit theorem of, of Benoit Kahn. Uh, was known a few years before us. We just gave a new different pr proof. Now I'll, I'll talk about uh, actually new results that we can prove using our ideas. So the first result that we can prove is a, a refined version of, of the central limit theorem, which is the local uh, limit theorem. So let me try to explain that to you. So let's start with the standard uh, central limit theorem, either by Lepage or Orban Waka. So the central limit theorem says that if you take this sequence of random variables, this is uh, the co-cycle uh, normalized by square root of n. Then uh, the theorem says that uh, the probability of this variable uh, falling into an interval alpha beta is uh, roughly the area under the bell curve uh, on the corresponding interval. Okay. So this is uh, one way of phrasing the central limit theorem. Now the local limit theorem is a, a much stronger version of this uh, that allows this interval here to shrink when n goes to infinity and shrink at a speed of uh, square root of n. So this is uh, the local limit theorem. So it was first proved again by, by Lepage in the same paper. So suppose mu uh, is non-elementary and suppose that the measure again has this strong finite uh, exponential moment condition. Then we have this uh, uh, weird expression here. So we don't, we don't need to understand uh, exactly uh, the expression here. But the important part is uh, these two parts. So the first one is that we have the same uh, variables here, right? So the normalized uh, cos cycle normalized by square root of n. And here, instead of having a fixed interval alpha beta, we have a, uh, an interval that shrinks with speed uh, square root of n. So this, uh, this window here is allowed to shrink when n goes into it. So the, the local limit theorem says that these things uh, converge and converge to, to the corresponding uh, limit for the, the Gaussian. So we don't, you don't need to understand why we have this exact thing in the right-hand side, but uh, what we have here is the, correspondent, uh, the corresponding uh, quantity for, for the Gaussian. Okay. So this, this says that these variables here behave like a Gaussian random variable, even at, at this small uh, square root of n uh, scale, okay? But again, uh, so the classical local limit theorem uh, actually works for second moment uh, 
measures with finite uh, random walks with finite second moment condition. And here we, we don't have uh, this condition, we have this uh, stronger exponential moment condition. So we would like to generalize this and get the, the optimal version. So the techniques of Benoit using martingales and large deviations uh, are not enough to, or at least I don't see how, how to use them to prove this final version, but our spectral, uh, spectral analysis do work really well here. So this is our theme from this year. So we could prove that the exact, exact same uh, theorem holds uh, under the optimal uh, condition of finite moment of order two. So the, the condition that we can have is this one and it, it is optimal because it's the same for, for classical random box. Okay. So yeah, so this is the theorem. So it's the optimal version of, of this theorem of Vaj. So let me uh, now give you some ideas or at least the tools that we use. I, I cannot give the proof because it's quite long and technical, but at least uh, can give you the, the ingredients uh, behind it. So the main tool, actually the, the main uh, player here is uh, a family of operators, which, which are called the pertur perturbed uh, Markov operators. So remember before we had this averaging operator on functions, that is the Markov operator given by this averaging. And now we consider uh, a perturbation of this operator where we add this weight here that depends on, on the co-cycle. Okay, so this is a standard technique in, in probability theory or in, in this uh, world of random walks on, on groups. So here, uh, just an uh, important remark, we consider only uh, purely imaginary perturbations. Due to our moment conditions, we can only perturb along the imaginary axis. So this is enough uh, for us. So why, why this is uh, useful? Because this allows us to encode uh, the characteristic functions of, of random variables. This is, for instance, if you take phi equals to one, this is exactly uh, the characteristic function of, of this random variable here. And this is a, uh, a standard way of studying random variables is, is by looking at its characteristic functions or the Fourier transform, if you want. And this also allows us to, to use some Fourier analysis, which is quite uh, useful here, okay? So yeah, so before stating the main results, so keep in mind that the, the operator that we are studying now is this peak psi, okay, this perturbed Markov operator. And for psi equals zero, so if you put zero here, we don't have this factor here. So it's the, the standard Markov operator from a few slides back, okay? So what is the main uh, result that we have for, for this family of operators? So we can prove that uh, these operators, they act continuously on the space, on the sublab space that I introduced before. And more importantly, the norm of these operators are strictly less than one whenever the parameter psi is different from zero. Okay, so the operator, as, as soon as we go uh, a little bit off zero, it's contracting it. And even for large values, which is harder to get, the, this norm is smaller than one. So if you've never, if you've never seen this kind of, of properties here and, and don't realize why it's important. So let me just give some analogy with classical uh, real random variables. So if you have a real random variable X here, we can look at Fourier transform or characteristic function chi of Xi, which is the expected value of e to the I Xi X. Okay, so this, this function here tells uh, almost everything about the random variable. And in the case of classical real random variables, we have only three possibilities for, for this kind of uh, Fourier transforms. Either uh, they're always uh, smaller than one as soon as Xi is different from zero, which is the, the analog of this property here, or we have uh, equality at some Xi zero. And in this case, we can show that actually X is quite special. It has values in some uh, arithmetic progression uh, over R. So this is called a lattice distribution. So the, it takes basically takes integer values or something like that. Or the third case, which is boring, that the characteristic function is constant, which means the, the norm is constant, which means that X is constant itself. So uh, what our theorem is saying is that uh, if you replace chi by the operator p, uh, psi by the operator p psi, uh, we prove that only the first uh, possibility can occur. So it's always smaller than one. Okay, so 
So this basically reflects that we cannot have some lattice uh, distribution uh, for, for the norms of the Van der Walk. So, so this is uh, vaguely related to some uh, non arithmeticity properties of, of the support of our probability measure. For instance, uh, related results uh, says that if you look at all the possible values of the log of the norms, this the closure of the set has no empty theory. So this indicates that we cannot have some, some, some random walk whose norms are, uh, lie in uh, arithmetic progression. Okay. So again, so this property that we obtain uh, is, is truly uh, inspired by classical probability theory. So be, uh, okay, before coming to the next slide, which is the last one, I guess, I have a, only a few remarks. So we can also have, uh, so the lo local limit theorem that we proved is for uh, this quantity here, so, right? The, the log of the dilations, right? The, so how the vectors grow. So this works under a second moment condition. So, but we can also prove uh, uh, local limit theorem for the, the coefficients or the entries of the matrices. So uh, in SL2, we have four entries. So we can also prove under a optimal or we think optimal moment condition that the absolute value of each entry also satisfies the same local limit theorem. And this, even in the exponential moment case is very recent uh, due to uh, Grama, Ke, and Xiao and from, the, from last year. And we were able to improve and get the, if not optimal, almost optimal version of it. Okay. So a second uh, thing that I would like to point out is that uh, so far I'm working with uh, Sobolev functions, but this is not enough for us because we need some pointwise estimates and Sobolev functions are, do not have, uh, at least uh, to start with, they don't have a pointwise value uh, at every point and we cannot control the C0 norm using Sobolev functions. So we need to work with other uh, function spaces in order to obtain uniform estimates. So we, we work with many different function spaces, for instance, Sobolev space, some log P spaces, which are some logarithmic uh, versions of whole space. And we also had to introduce new function spaces, uh, for instance, some spaces like this W that is uh, sandwiched between uh, Sobolev log P and Sobolev C0. Okay, so there's some, some amount of technical work that we have to do to prove these, these theorems. And finally, uh, we can also use the same techniques. This will appear in a forthcoming work. We can use the same techniques to study the full here for coefficients of the first one back measure and, and other fine limit theorems. Okay, any questions? Okay, so yeah, in the last slide, I would mention uh, a little bit about this uh, Fourier coefficient problems and, and how it's related to, to what we, we are doing. So suppose now that we have a measure that is not supported on, on, on SL2C, but supported on SL2R. So all our random matrices are, are real, of real coefficients, okay? Then uh, the action on CP1 actually preserves uh, the real form uh, RP1, which is naturally identified with a circle, right, S1. So in particular, this implies that the first Stenberg measure is actually supported uh, in this uh, circle S1, okay? And this is a classical field of study. If you have a probability measure supported on the circle, you can study its Fourier transform. And the properties of its Fourier transforms uh, reflect uh, very fine properties of the measure mu. So we can do the same here. We have a measure supported on the circle. We can study its Fourier transform. So uh, since the measure is supported on S1, we can define the following function, uh, mu hat, which is the integral of this exponential e to the uh, i k theta over the circle with respect to the stationary measure. And here K is a, is a real number. So uh, for instance, if, if, if mu is absolutely continuous, we get just the usual Fourier transform, right? And for the usual Fourier transform, uh, we know that uh, the decay of, of the Fourier transform at infinity is related to the regularity of, of this Tully function. And here's 
more or less the same. So if you know that uh, these coefficients decay sufficiently fast to zero, we, we have some sort of, of regularity properties of, of mu. Okay. So and this is, is our uh, theorem. So suppose that mu is non-elementary and has a finite second moment. So again, this uh, condition here. Then uh, we can show that uh, this Fourier transform vanishes at infinity. So if you, if you make k tend to infinity, then these coefficients, these Fourier coefficients tend uh, to zero. Okay. So this is an important property. It's so important that it has uh, its own name. So these, these kind of measures that have this decay are called Heichmann measures. So they are very well studied since a very long time ago and related to convergence of Fourier series and other arithmetic properties of, of the measures and et cetera. So what we prove then is that uh, the first and back measure of uh, measures with finite second moments are Heichmann uh, measures, okay? So this is uh, not new in the case where we have explanation moments. So the, our work is actually inspired by a paper of Jalong Lee from 2018. So he proved the same results under the strong exponential moment case, and we were able using our analysis of uh, spectral, uh, the spectral analysis of uh, the Markov operators, we were able to generalize to this uh, finite second moment condition that we, we don't know yet if it's optimal or not. Okay. And as I said before, the, the Fourier decay is related to the regularity of mu, but not only, it also reflects some, some structure of the support, uh, which is related to, to arithmetic properties that are still a bit mysterious to me, but it's a little bit more than just playing a regularity. Okay, I think uh, that's all for now. So I'll stop here. Thank you very much. Yes, yeah, thank you Olga, for an interesting talk. Um, any questions? I got a question from a chart. I just saw some technical from the chat. So yeah, there's a question from Bontule. Can your techniques show the existence of some other dynamical objects like center manifolds, stable and unstable manifolds? I don't know. I have no, no idea. Yeah, if you if you're thinking in terms of like Ozelidet's uh, type of theorems, you can prove them uh, here. In case of P1, it's quite boring because you have only one non-trivial direction. But if you look at matrices in SLD, for instance, acting on on, on CD or, or PD minus one, we have some sort of Ozelidet's uh, decomposition given by by the singular values of the matrices, and this follows by by looking at the uh, the shift, the Bernoulli shift. I can give you some references if you want. Oh, so they cannot, uh, they cannot.